Hello out there and welcome to the Revere Veterans and Community Show. Today I have a special guest. His name is Smoker Joe Sheffro from East Boston. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time out. Before we start, Joe, tell us a little about yourself. Well, I'm a singer and I'm also a hairstylist. I work in Winthrop. I worked uh, in Revere for about five years, right down the road, down on Broadway at the end of Broadway, where, uh, just before Brandano's Bakery was. And then after that, I moved to East Boston, uh, cutting hair. And now I'm in Winthrop for the past four years now. So you like to clip people then? I clip a lot of people. <laughs> I can tell. So why do I... <laughs> no, Joe. Tell them where you're located in Winthrop in case people want to get a haircut. Now, let me tell you, I've seen your haircuts, and they are excellent. I'm, I, uh, I'm at 9 Pauline Street in Winthrop. It's across from the uh, police station. Oh, I used to work right near there, by the way. What's the name of that street that goes right? There's a sporting Herman goods street. store. Herman Street. Yep, there's a sporting goods store right around there. Yep, the right area. up the street, right up the yep. road. Around the corner from the police station, too. And by the way, do you do little children, too? Oh, yeah. So sure. any age limit or just? No, any, any, any age does. Whatever it is. So if months, the mothers oh, want to bring their babies to you, sure you'll take can. good care of them. I always do. And the seniors, too. And the seniors, too, <laughs> absolutely, with the seniors, definitely. Okay, Joe, now I want to get into you. You do a lot of things for us at Revere. I'm a veteran. I come down every summer to watch you play because you do a terrific thing. And for the people that know, don't know him, his name is Smoking Joe and the Henchman. Tell us about that. Uh, well, we've been together. Well, I've, I've had the band since 1963. In 1963, I started um, with one of my best friends, actually two of my best friends. One is my drummer, who's still with me now, which is kind of good, and it's great. How long has he been with you, by the way? He's been with me for 51 years now. This is the 51st year. You're <laughs> no, you're giving me a rage away, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I don't mind. I'm 64 years old. So, and wow. We were 13 yep. uh, together. And one of my best friends, his name, he was a guitar player in the band. His name was Tom Galeazzo, who lives down in Dedham. And he plays with me occasionally now, which is kind of nice to have friends, you know, that I've known all my life. Right. Tell us a little about your youth. I understand you also played the accordion when you were young. <laughs> yeah. Don't laugh. No, no, no I did too. So yeah, one, yeah I, played for, uh, I played for about four and a half years. And um, I had a good couple of teachers. Uh, one was uh, Mr. Charles started me out and the other one was Mr. Balkianda and we were on Meridian Street at the Meridian Hall building or uh, something like that and uh, it was nice. They had, all, they had uh, dance teachers there and guitar teachers, drum teachers and everything. It was just, it was a, it was a good experience and uh, Knowledge-wise about the accordion, I probably don't know as much as I should, but I know little. How many basses? When I started, I got to tell you, 12 basses. Yeah, I started on the 12, and then I went to 120. Oh, uh, I, I then I went from 12 to 24 to 48 to 96, no. and then 100. No, I went from 12 to 120. And you did all right with the 120? Well, it kind of confused me a little bit, but it was okay. It was right. good. In case people don't know that, there's a little button. I don't know if it was on your accordion, <coughs> but it was on mine. That Charlie. has a little dent in there. Charlie. Yep. Charlie I'm with C. the hole. Right. That's C. Yep. That's a C. And that's the only way you can find out once you get your finger on there. To that's take where it is. Left. Exactly. Right. Yep. Good. Now, Joe, you did a nice DJ job at the Don Oriole Nursing Home. Yes. And a lot of the people... A lot of the seniors went there, and a lot of them said they never moved around as much as they did but <laughs> listening to your music, which I got to admit was terrific. How did you ever get started with the DJ bit, if I may ask you? Because well, you do a lot of, you sing good, you do, uh, yeah. you're a good showman. Well, the reason why I started doing DJ work is uh, back around, I guess, maybe the 70s or, you know, late 70s, early 80s, a lot of DJs were coming in. And they would take all our jobs, oh. or as we call it, gigs. Right. And the weddings were far and few because you could hire a DJ and they could play all the music. Right. Anything. And a band couldn't play everything. Uh, not that we couldn't, but we didn't. And you just 
what we did what we did and we tried to uh, it was always like you know we gave the bride and groom so many songs we would learn for them and uh, so it just got less and less and then I decided well you know I, I, I know a lot of music I know that I've known music since probably 1954 uh, not I mean I was a big Elvis fan when I was young but I never copied him or did anything I could do his songs, but that's about it. But uh, what happened was I decided to, instead of going against the grain, join the rank and make money. And not that I, I never really undercut DJs because I found that a lot of DJs were working for $1,000 or $1,500. A night? For the wedding. <laughs> and the band was charging approximately the same and some as we, naturally now it's a little bit more but uh, they were making all the money by themselves so I figured can I ask you a question sure. if I may? Uh, let, let's say an average DJ just goes in to play at a function hall uh, for four hours what would they be paid they, they usually get paid you know anyways between seven to twelve hundred fifteen hundred depends for four just hours depends. yeah for four hours Sure. And I got to ask you. Um, That's not what I charge. No, no, I know okay. that. I know that. And let okay. me tell you, if you did, you would be worth every okay. penny. That That's I okay. got to be honest with well, you. Well, only because I sing, too. That's, That's right. one thing DJs can't do. No. Some of them try, and it's okay. It's fine. Right. But I got uh, today they have, when I was doing it, I'm sure when you were doing it years ago, you had to drag the CDs and the records. Yeah. And this, now they have that machine, and they say they can put 20,000 songs into it? No, I have a computer that runs about 350,000 songs. Songs? Yeah. Songs. And you can carry it out all in one hand? Yeah, but you still have to carry the speakers and your microphones. Forget Without that, but I mean the songs themselves, you can carry 300,000 songs on one sure. hand? Sure, yeah. Yeah, that, that's about right. I got a hernia, you just carry a five CD, Joe. <laughs> Well, I, I I used to carry all the uh, the CD boxes. I used to carry around six of them, and I used to carry a, a bigger machine. But now I don't. Now it's a computer. Right, and now I gotta tell you, they have on the music on the Revere TV Comcast. Mm -hmm. They got about forty or fifty music channels, and they yeah. got beautiful music now, like on the five hundred series there. Right. Yeah. Yep. So they have uh, sometimes the latest songs. They have country, hip hop. They have everything. I see it. I know. And the 300,000, I'm correct when I say 300,000? Yeah, absolutely. So you got all kinds of music like waltzes and tangos and rumbas and samba? If I can't sing it, I'll find it. It's on my computer somewhere. That's good to know. Yeah, I know it's, it's a great uh, tool to have. And I would like to ask you one question. And I have to, before I go, go right on, ahead. I have to thank a good friend of mine. Um, his hey. name is Chris Fury, and he's a DJ. He's not a singer, but he's a DJ, and he taught me everything that I know about my computer. So I'd like to say that. Well, and how do you get the songs into, uh, if it's a secret, don't tell me, but how do you get the songs into your computer? Well, you have to uh, download them from... Where, from the uh, radio? That if you have, no, well, I had like uh, over, I don't know. Is there special companies thousand, that do that for yeah, DJs? Yeah, no, a thousand CDs and... My friend Chris downloaded everything for me. So you had to take all those CDs? CDs and put, and put them on a computer. They go into an external drive. So when did you start out? When you were three years old? <laughs> no, I mean, no. <laughs> no, no, I mean I was that's a lot of work. Well, it took a lot of time, but I got them. Um, my wife got them for me for Christmas right. now, a few uh, years back. I do a little music at the senior center, and I do mm -hmm. mean a little music. Like I will play Italian songs, polkas. Yeah. Um, German songs, French. Yeah, I have them all on my computer. Just what I mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. You know how I got to come in? I got to come in with a big bag, one in each hand. Yeah. I got a three uh, CD player. No, I got a little tired of that. Okay. I got a record machine that plays 78s, and I still got records at home that were recorded by the great singer on, on Rico Caruso. You ever hear of Caruso? Yes, I have. Yep. The disc only has one side recording. Right. Right. That's well, I have I have a '78. It's uh, right. Gene Autry's Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. The original '78. The original one. The original by Gene song. Autry? Yep. 
I got a couple by the, uh, well, late. <laughs> it would be late for him. Al Jolson. Yep. Enrico Caruso. And there was a great German singer, I don't know if you ever heard of him, called Richard Tauber. Ring a mm, bell? No. From the 20s in Germany. I got a couple of his records. Yeah. So that's good. Now, I got to say, if people want to hire you to do the DJ for them, how can they reach you? Like they did at well, the nursing home. Okay, they reach me at my, uh, on my, well, I don't have, I have a website, but it's, it's down right now. But uh, they can always email me at uh, sjhenchman at aol.com. Right. Or they can call me on my cell phone, which is 617-233-9544. Uh, right. Now, you also have a friend who used to be a counselor in the city of Revere. His name is Paul Tater. Now, I didn't no, know Paul. No, no, Pat Tater. Pat Tater, excuse Pat. me. Excuse me, Pat. I didn't know him that well. But you did, so let us hear about it. Well, him. back in 1964, Pat's son and had a band. And their friends, his name was um, John Tater, and they had a band called uh, Johnny and the Patriots from Revere, from here. And we were playing in a, uh, a parking lot in East Boston back in 1964. And he came by and asked if his son could play, and I said, sure. So it helped us too because we didn't make a lot of money back then. We were making, I think it was uh, two uh, large pizzas and ten cokes. Is that how you they paid in those days? Well, it was, it was, it was good. It was if great. If I was doing GJ and I had to get paid like that, I stopped it then. Well, <laughs> we did it every every Sunday for uh, a year um, outside during the summertime, if, as long as the weather was good. And uh, they came down and uh, they they were good. And we became friends with them. Musicians, I guess, we're different people. We uh, we like each other. Can you read music too, Joe? Uh, slowly. No, no, no. <laughs> slowly, I mean, yeah, yeah, slowly. It's the same here. Yeah. Very slowly. Slowly. And anyways, when they when they came, you know, we were, we were we were became friends with them, and they were all nice guys. And I'm sure they. I hope they thought we were nice guys too. And I kept in touch with a couple of them which was uh, Pat's son, John, and there's another one, his name is Marino, oh. uh, from Revere, too. And we had a lot of fun with them. They came down, then they got us to play down the hall where I play outside at the American like Legion. The Legion. We played downstairs at the hall, and they asked us if we would like to come there. So they played in East Boston, and we played in Revere. We'd go back and forth, and it was fun. We had a lot of fun. Right, so Joe, you're going to be appearing there this summer, and the American Legion, folks, is 249 Broadway, right, Revere, correct. Mass. And it's sometimes in July and August that you do this. Yeah, okay? probably ju most likely July and August. So one. check your schedule, yep. and when you hear Smoker Joe and the Henchman, come on down, folks. We'd yep. love to have you. We really would. Sometimes we have you know, special guests sometimes, too. Depends. Right. I like to talk about, you had a cousin. I'm a veteran, we are a veteran, you're a veteran of the community and a great oh, veteran of the community. You. you had a cousin, I believe, who was in the Vietnam War? Yes. And his name was John? Gravelisi. Gravelisi. Thank you, Joe. Tell us about John. Um, well, he was a CB, which a CB is a construction builder. Right. And um, back then, uh, whether we belonged there or not, you know, he was there for a couple of years. and. I remember him writing me letters and telling me all about Vietnam. Unfortunately, I never went myself, but um, when he came back, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't recognized, I guess, Let which he should have been. I know that they were very, very mistreated. Rude, I know. Okay. And I remember reading in the papers and seeing it on television that yep. there was an organization that if a Vietnam, vet, a Vietnam soldier got killed, and they had a funeral, they would go down and heckle the mother and yeah. father because their son was over in Vietnam. Correct. Protecting us so we can have the freedom that you and I enjoy Absolutely. to this yes. day. So on behalf of Revere and the Commonwealth of Mass, to all your Vietnam veterans, thank you for your service. And by the way, Absolutely. since I didn't know John Gravelisi, That's correct. Cousin, let me thank you on behalf of him for his service, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, today's a pastor in a church. <laughs> Who's that? My cousin. John? Yes. Oh, he's still alive? Oh, yeah, he's out in Seattle. 
Oh, she had a lost John, if you get this on Facebook or YouTube, tell her yeah. hello from Joe Absolutely. and from yours truly. That's right. Thank you. Now, I see you got some baseball pictures there that you made. Yeah, I was going to give them to you so that you could uh, maybe, yep. maybe, you'll, maybe you'll know who they are. Okay, let me guess. Who th well, this one is simple. I'm going to hold these up, so see if you can get them in. This one here is Babe Ruth, the Sultan of Swat. Absolutely. And, by the way, i got to thank you for telling me the number he were. That's right. Number three. Number three. And I did not know that before we went on the show, so thank you. Well, you got that, Serge? The reason why he won number three was because he was a first baseman, even though he was a pitcher at first, and then he was in, in the outfield also. Because when baseball, when they first started, never had numbers. They had just, you know, you just played your position, and that was it. And what they did was they came up with the numbers. And I learned that from a, two good friends of mine from Revere, uh, John and Joe Luciano. They're big collectors, by the way. They're big card collectors. And if you want to know anything, anything about sports, you can ask my friends. They know it all. This That's one, a fact. Okay. Serge, hold this one. Photograph this one. This one here was the Lou Gehrig. Let me make sure I got it right. Yep, Lou Gehrig. And he won number four. Correct. And tell us, you're more knowledgeable about baseball than I am, even though I come from New York. The only thing I could tell you is that I played against this high school, which was Commerce High. That's oh. where he went to. When I was playing for Harron High School in New York, at one time we played against this high school. But you know more about Lou Gehrig than I do. So well, like, like I said, the only reason why is because of my two friends. That's the truth. And I learned a lot because you ask questions, which is good. Yep. That's how you find out. Exactly. But could you explain to the people that at that time they named the disease after Lou Gehrig because what kind of a disease is it? If you well, know, it, Joe? it attacks your muscles and just destroys you. If you get it in your upper body, um, just it crushes you. Way? It's like a cancer? It's not a cancer, but it just destroys all your muscles and everything, and it's just terrible. By the way, this one you gave me, but this one is an easy one to know. This is number nine. He used to play on the Red Sox, Ted Williams. That's right. Before you give me a little history about him, can I read something that's on there, Joe, sure. just for a little yes. bit? Thank you for these pictures, by the way. Right. Uh, listen to this, Joe. It was 1938 before the Sox brought Williams to spring training, and even then he was confident to the point of cockiness. I like people who are cocky. One story goes that when someone said to him, wait till you see Jimmy Fox hit, and Williams' cool retort was, Wait till Fox sees me hit. So <laughs> tell me a little about Teddy. Well, I remember, I remember I was at his last game when he hit the home run and at, his, at the final game. And what they did was they – he was a great player, let's put it that way. He was just – I think he's the best. A lot of people well, think – Well, nobody has passed his 406 yet? Well, a lot of people think he was. But Only if you're from New York. Yeah, I guess so. But I'm not. But I am. I lived on 33rd Street and Floyd Stanley and Joe. I know you did. Okay. And, uh, but I, you know, I respect New York. I respect. And I love Boston. All their players. Uh, but I, I, in my heart, Ted Williams was the best baseball player ever. Period. He could, he could see the stitches on the ball. That's right. And I know that's a fact. What was the service? Do you remember? He was in the, uh, I think it was the Army Air Force. A pilot, right? Pilot, yep. Yep. And, and I think he spent six years out of his life. He lost six years of his uh, midlife, so, yeah. which would everybody would be uh, just gaining a lot of speed. But he's, he went in the service. So besides being a terrific ball player, he was a terrific hero. And he was a veteran, too. Right, Ted. If Absolutely. you're up there listening, thank you for your service. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about the Red Sox. Because, you know, coming from the Big Apple, I was with the Yankees and the Giants and the Dodgers. Nope. We had three teams there. Well, you had the Boston Braves and the... We had the Braves. And actually, I think I'm pretty sure that the, um, the Red Sox, I think when we first started, was the Americans, the, Reds, the Boston Americans. I'm pretty sure. But it took us a long time to win another championship World Series. That's you right. Know. You know, it's a shame that Ted never wore a, a, a World Series ring in all the yeah. years that he was with the Red Sox. Well, the curse is broken now. We oh. broke it three times. Yeah. And I just watched today on uh, on the news channel that uh, 
Obama invited all the uh, Red Sox players from last year. That's right, and they went from last to, to first, first, which is I don't think any yeah. other team has done that. Well, in 2012, I liked I liked Valentine. He was the the manager. Oh, the manager, right? But I he had a lot to prove, and I guess he just didn't prove it the right way. He was for himself, I think. That's just an opinion. But uh, the players in 13. They took care of everything. I got to go back to you when I was a little kid in Brooklyn, New York, where I lived. We had Ebbets Field, which could only hold about 30,000 mm -hmm. people. Yep. And we had the knot hole gang. I don't know if you had it in Boston. Yeah, I used to look through the fence. Right. Except was the, a, the knot hole was in the fence. fence. And we would knock it out. Oh, that's right. And the police didn't like that yeah. because sometimes when you hit it and you hit it hard, it would shoot and maybe hit a fan or something. Yeah, so they know. used to chase us away. Well, we had Nickerson Field. That's right. Is that what they call it? I here? think that's well, Braves Field. Where yeah. I think it was Nickerson. Oh, that was a Commonwealth became, Valley. Yeah, became Nickerson Field, but that's when it all started back then. But I remember they we had an old gang too. Did you? I wasn't there. I was too young. Yep. And you know, after a while, the Dodgers. There was a pitcher there by the name of Fat Freddie Fitzsimmons. I don't know if you ever heard that no. name. And a first baseman by the name of Dolph Camilli. Camilli. An Italian, a good, good Italian guy. Yeah, that was nice. Extra, an excellent first baseman. Yep. So what they did is they went to the management of the Dodgers, and they asked them instead of us peeking to the fences if the seats were not sold, the bleacher seats, mm -hmm. to let us in. And sometimes we would get in to see a nice free game. Yeah. And one of my heroes at that time, not only was I a Dodger fan, besides being the thumper, Ted Williams was uh, Stan the Man Musial. I'm Musial. sure you heard of him. Yep, St. Louis. Yep, St. Louis Cardinals. Shortstop. Right. I want to go back to your music here because uh, you sing. Are there any famous singers that, kept, that made it into the big time that came out of Rivera or East Boston? Well, one particular that I know is a good friend of mine. His name is Bobby Vincent. Uh, Bobby Vincent back in the... Is that any relation to Rosalie Vincent's... Well, that's not his real name. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's a stage... <laughs> no, no, I just was... <laughs> it's a stage name. Okay. <laughs> Uh, like I use Smoke and Joe. It's, the, you know, it's, the, a stage it's my stage name. No, but you don't really smoke, though. N no, I did. You did? Yeah, I did. I, for a long time. That. That's how I got my name. Oh. Because I used to smoke on stage. For a while, I thought I was Frank Sinatra, but <laughs> because it was like you know a drink in one hand and a cigarette so in the other. So how long ago to have you quit smoking? Uh, nineteen. I think it was 1970, either 79 or 80. 40 years. I gave mine up about 45, 50 years ago. But yeah. let me tell you, it's the best thing I ever did. Well, it... Financial-wise? You realize it. Well, now it's $10 a pack, so it's kind of hot. How much? $10 a pack. So if you do two packs a day, you, you, it's $20 a day. You know what it was when I was a kid, Joe? You're going to fall over. Well, eight cents. Eight, eight cents. cents a pack. Well, I can, remember, I can remember 21 cents. $10 Lucky's. a pack? Lucky's and Camels were 21 cents. So Paul Malls were 24. So that's $100 a cotton? Today. Unless you go down to South Town or North Carolina or something where they make, you know, they have the tobacco fields. That's where they have them. So if you're an addict uh, and a smoking addict. Yeah, a lot of people have been cutting down a lot. I hope they, I hope a lot of people just, you know, I'm not trying to steal anybody's job. No, no, anybody, no. But, you know. It's. I don't think it's worth it to have people smoking. Not only that, but to tell you, smoking a lot also gives you lung cancer. True. Okay, Joe, we got about three and a half minutes. I'm going to give you two and a half. You can talk about anything you want or ask me anything you want. So take it well, away. You know, I'm just, I'm, I want to thank you first. I want to thank you for asking me. It's my pleasure to have people like you come up here. You do good things for our community. I, I think there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of room for everybody Music-wise, to play a lot of places, you know, that they like to play. And, and the young guys that are coming up, I just hope they don't forget. As, as I grew up, I remember, um, I remember something my father said to me. And because we I grew up in the 60s. So the music we played was uh, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and uh, Eric Burden and the Animals and... Uh, my father came up to me one time and said to me, why don't you play some real music or sing some real music? And I said, I said, gee, Dad. He says, you know, this is my era. You know, he says, why don't you play something good? I said, like what? And he said, how about some Frank Sinatra or Tony Bennett? 
And I said, well, look, that's yours. I said, right. That's, that's not my mine. era, too. But, but, sorry, I never listened to my father because now I sing those songs today. And they're good songs. They really are good songs. And I appreciated, I appreciate them now, I guess, more ever than I did when I was young. But actually, you know, when you're young, you're young and foolish right. and you don't pay attention because you know more than what your father does. I grew up with the big bands, Joe. Glenn Miller, yep. Benny Goodman, Harry James, sure. like Xavier Cougat, yep. Kay Kaiser, yep. Phil Spatoni. Probably yep. these people never even heard of them. I, re I remember all, all of them. You know, I, I, growing up because... Who's your favorite singer now, by the way, if you could pick one? No offense, man, but uh, just pick today. one. Today. Today? Today. From my, my era or from... Anybody. From my era right on up to the present. <laughs> well, <laughs> a lot of people can't understand, but... Uh, growing up, I loved James Brown. Oh, he was the one good? Mr. He was, good? I yeah, he Mr. sang, good. well, he sang I Feel Good, good. and Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, and uh, when I was young, I modeled myself after him. Smokey Joe, a qu quick question for you. Before we go up the air, could you tell us something about the Moose Club, because you do a lot for that. Well, uh, yeah, the Moose, I'm a member of the Moose, and I'm also on the, uh, the board, on the committee there. I'm um, a three-year trustee this year. Who are uh, some of the people which are there? Well, uh, the administrator there, is, his name is Wesley Clemens. I had him on the show. The, uh, I know you did, because he happens to be my cousin also. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and uh, my good friend, John Galatis, he's the governor. Yep. And then we got Paul Weber, he's yep. the uh, prelate. Uh, then we have Joe Bucci and Paul DePlazzi, they're trustees. And I know I'm forgetting somebody, and if I am, I apologize. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we try to do, we're, we're doing good things in the community, for the community, because um, we're trying to, we're a family center. I we're trying to I'm, give it back. And by the way, i got to say you did a beautiful job renovating the place. Thank you. And it's uh, not me, but the, a lot of members put their sweat oh, into there. Oh, there were some members that did that? Some of the members, and, you know, there was a few that came down, donated their services, uh, painting, running wires, and, you know, uh, everything that we, everything right now that we've been doing in the club is for the community. It's a family center. That's what it is. Right, and you also play music for the club? You donate yeah. your time? Yep. Uh, no, I don't, no, I don't, okay. I don't donate. Uh, I'm there, like, maybe once or twice a month. And sometimes I'm doing uh, functions there myself that people hire me to go and they rent the place there, which is great. Right, Joe. So that's good. But I thank you for uh, letting me tell you about the moose because I, was, yeah, thank you for telling I almost us forgot about the myself. Moose. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. First of all, let me thank you for taking the time to come up. Thank, thank you. you. God bless you, Joe, for thank what you. you do for us. God bless our troops, the people are there. But Absolutely. I always finish, God bless our great country, the United States of America. Yep. And thank you, Miss Betsy Ross. Until the next time we meet again, thank you. Thank you. God bless America. Yep. Mm -hmm.